I'm going to have a conversation with you a little bit about climate change. I was here yesterday when Jim Hansen, the redoubtable and amazing Jim Hansen, gave his remarks. And uh, in some ways, we are in complete alignment. And in others, we're doing some very different things. Before I begin, I actually want to say one thing, is that when any of us comes before you and talks about what we do, we sometimes forget to recognize that what we're doing about this huge, enormous challenge and opportunity of climate change doesn't mean that everyone, what else is doing isn't also valuable. So as I speak about some of the innovation that we're doing, I want you to know that I rely, as you do, on all the work of the other organizations, both in the United States and around the world. It seems pretty important to say that. So I've been at this climate change thing for a while. And I joined Vice President Gore right before, right after the president was sworn in in 2009 to lead the legislative and political and national campaign to pass legislation. Shortly thereafter, in the end of 2009, Copenhagen happened, and then the legislation died a rather painful death in 2010, at which point it was time to take a step or two or ten back and look at this huge uh, challenge we have before us and try to sort out what we should be doing. So the conversation I want to have to you today is about conversation. There is really nowhere in the world when climate change where is talked about in an open and uh, pr productive way. So we reached out in 2010 to those people who drive conversation in the United States today, and that's the marketing and ad agencies. So really, there are three things I want to really focus on. One is behavioral science. The second is social entrepreneurship, with, like Tall. And the third is what the 21st century opportunities of communications give us. On the first side, you know, on the advocacy world, we focused almost exclusively on climate science. And it puzzled me, as I know it's puzzled all of you, why we can't break through. Well, there's some very specific reasons for it. And we haven't focused on that, which is in the world of behavioral science, it is well known that human beings are deeply resistant to taking action on any kind of threat that's distant in time and place. And for many of us, climate change has been that for all of our lives until very recently. The second is the, what they call the collective action problem, which is in effect when you move to do something, there is an, a feeling of insufficiency in your action, as if there's really nothing you can do or could measure to see that you have an impact on this huge global problem. And those two things, coupled with an industry manufacturing and feeding that personal denial, has left us where we are today. And so, for us, it was an opportunity to step back and look at what can we do to break through with this communication challenge, which I think is one of the last big hurdles before we can move forward. At the end of the day, we restyled ourselves the Climate Reality Project. First, because the words climate and reality must always be wed. Second, because the word project implied what I want it to be, as does the Vice President, a beginning and an end. That we can actually shift this dialogue, both in the United States and around the world, and move this organization into something very different, which is implementation of these changes. And the, and the application of that thinking led us to hire a creative team. The second thing I want to view is because I came, as you can tell from the introduction, from a pretty traditional advocacy career. I'm a lawyer. As we were joking around with a few folks at the cocktail hour last night, I'm a recovering policy wonk, and always will be. Uh, it was a shift to move away from my belief, certainly manifested in the legislative campaign that we ran, that we could do this through the traditional means of policy and politics. But I've learned something really important. When you look at the world today and you think of a quadrant, and at the top of the center is politics and at the bottom is personal, and the cross, if you think of the right as being issues or realities that are socially repugnant, that we refuse to speak of, and those that are magnetic. Climate change sits up in the political and repugnant quadrant. And we can't even have conversations at our dinner tables. My Uncle Bill. 
You each have one. We all have many. <laughs> My Uncle Bill, even during the flooding in Colorado, I was actually stranded in our house for two and a half days, communicating with him. He was still reluctant to attribute this extraordinary seven-day tropical storm stuck in Colorado in the midst of the Rocky Mountains attributed to climate change. Each of us has that reality in our lives. And so we've been about the business of trying to provoke conversation and doing it through something that traditional advocacy had never really allowed me, which is innovation, social innovation, like Tall spoke of. We were lucky to be in a relationship with Jeff Skoll, the founder of eBay, an incredible man who's also started Participant Media and whose films are driving a lot of the social conversation today about a number of issues. He is a huge hero of ours and someone who really fosters this kind of conversation. So at the end of the day, we've been building and creating and putting together a series of innovative digital tools, all because Jeff and others like him recognize that in order to move this issue, we really have to experiment. We actually have to try to reach people in fundamentally different ways than we have been in the past. We are a tribe, those of us who have known about climate change for a long time, and we know each other and we speak clearly to each other. But most people don't understand us. And the language of science, which is so rich to us, is not a language that they understand, particularly if it has been politicized, as it has in the United States, into that socially repugnant place. We have to bring it over to the personal and the magnetic. How do you do that? In today's world, that's culture. In today's world, it's reaching people through different language, different opportunities, and reaching out to engage the universal language of music. So I want to show you something that we just created called What I Love. It's a short little video, serial, te what we call in the industry, teaser video. The heart does not move in mysterious ways. Its motives are simple and abounding. Each flicker of light, every drop of water, There is no mystery in why we love. The mystery is what we would do without it. Take the experience. Find the things you can't live without. You'll notice that climate change is not mentioned. This is the next one we're going to show in a second. What we've done is created a, something for people for whom the digital world is an expression of their creativity. The videography of this is very magnetic, and inside this digital tool is an opportunity to create your own canvas of those things you love the most. Is it the ocean, or is it, or is it cities? Is it chocolate, or is it music? Is it your children? Do you want to do sports? And the series of choices as you run through the experience, the videography, is created in a way that actually pulls you into the experience and creates that sense of connection and resonance as you make your choices and create your canvas, which is much like a Facebook page. But as that canvas is being created, the videos shift on a curve and you begin to see what climate change is doing to this thing that you love. A tool like this is designed for those people like my Uncle Bill, whose values I share, but our politics and our policy worlds have clashed forever. He can enter that conversation and start to listen because I've touched with that communication a chord in him that has nothing to do with politics, but has to do with what are his core values. 
This next piece is a snippet of a larger piece that I want to show you because I'm really excited about it. Cause a lot of people like to have a feast Not so many can stomach the killing A lot of traffic on the streets So who's really doing all the drilling Keep on filling What could never be full My imagination got a hold Climate change to me is the biggest issue That our generation is up against It's our responsibility to make this stuff Not seem like some big step we have to take in our life That's a negative thing It's just this way of living can be positive In my mind, in my mind I would like to leave a world that's just as beautiful, if not even better, for my kids. I got to grow up in Hawaii, and I got to spend a lot of time out in nature, and so it's had a really profound effect on me. To be out in the surf and on these sailing canoes with my dad growing up, all these times that I, I was lucky enough to get to spend time uh, surrounded by natural beauty, and so it's something that I want to be able to share to make sure to keep the world a beautiful place. You might recognize that artist, Jack Johnson. We reached out to him because his voice is multi-generational and because music is a language that we all understand, even in the midst of our differences. Jack cares about these things very much, and we asked him if he would help us take this symbol, which we've created. It's a simple little washer with a magnet on the back, which we want to become that which is those who wear it or employ it in some way is a simple symbol about wanting action on climate. But instead of introducing it, as I would have for many years, through the avenue of an organization, we're introducing it through music. That guitar, and there's a wonderful video of this story, is made out of pine bark beetle kill all over the West, and particularly in Colorado and Montana and Wyoming. Pine bark beetles have decimated hundreds of thousands of acres of our forests. And his guitar maker, Pepe Romero, traveled, who was in that photo, to Colorado and picked out a tree. And he, we commissioned two guitars and three or four ukuleles out of this piece of wood. And he made that guitar and put this green ring around the sound hole. And that guitar Jax has on tour right now. He's traveling around the world. And when he comes back, he's going to sign it and then we're moving it on to the band Mana, which is in Mexico, in Central and South America, the Beatles. And Mana, which has cared about these issues for many years, is excited to actually have the lead singer start playing that guitar. And from there, it will moon to the Palatones, which is another amazing band from South Africa. And on and on, I have no idea where we're gonna end up. The notion is that the conversation starts best when it comes in through voices for whose, that have not chosen sides. And they're speaking about climate change through the heart. The other piece that's critical to this narrative is narrative. One of the big challenges that I found after running that legislative campaign, besides hitting the wall of politics around health care and the economy crashing, was the fact that there's no narrative about climate change that we can live inside. There's not a common language that we can discuss this. And we have to do that. Climate reality, the reality of climate change, is a subtle and not so subtle start to that conversation. Over time, we've been creating other kinds of assets, as they say in the marketing world, or tools to try to help drive conversation to where it needs to be. Recently, we put on an event just this week, although it seems a long time ago, called 24 Hours of Reality. We started these three years ago, knowing nothing whatsoever about putting on productions. I'm very impressed with this entire thing, because now I know how much work it takes to do this. And knowing nothing about live streaming, and knowing nothing about how to do something for 24 hours. We went around the world, tracking stories about climate change. And over time, we've learned that 24 Hours of Reality is an opportunity for us to start a conversation. So just this last week, we actually started it in a place called The Cost of Carbon. 24 Hours of Reality, The Cost of Carbon. Right now, around the world, we fall into two 
overly simplified but still accurate camps. All around the world we are in denial. Many parts of the world it's because of a lack of education and awareness. Even in sub-Saharan Africa where all of us know they are living with climate change and have been for many years, there's still no understanding that that which is happening to them has a climate change connection. Or in countries like the United States, Australia, the UK, and Canada, where denial is an industry funded by the fossil fuel companies and by the Koch brothers and others who have fed on our own personal inability to grasp this huge global challenge and make it our own. Over time, these two camps have led to an inertia around the world because there is no shared narrative and there is no understanding still today that carbon pollution is the cause at its simplest level. Yes, it's much more complex and as Jim talked about with the various greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. At the end of the day, most of the people in the world don't need all of that information. They need a cause and a solution. We've talked long and hard about this and at the end of the day, we've decided that the focus on helping everyone in the world understand that we're already paying the price of carbon pollution will help us shift to that shared, simple, framed solution to put a price on carbon. Cause, solution. Simple language shared by others all around the world. Simple symbol, clear direction. What do we have to do? Put a price on carbon. What do we have to do? Put a price on carbon. There are thousands and thousands of policy directives that fall underneath that frame. But in order to drive that action, to get the R&D budgets to pass the statutes both at the state and federal level, we need a simple narrative. So that person, Maggie, who used to testify regularly in front of Congress, doesn't spend time doing that anymore. Instead, we're focused on trying to create individual digital projects as well as grassroots initiatives that help people reach this language, this shared space. So we're going to run one more short little piece that is another teaser video for 24 hours. Congress has agreed on more than $50 billion in relief for the victims of Superstorm Sandy. Vast chunks of Mozambique were flooded. Two million people affected. At least 10 people have died in Shanghai. $7 billion in damage killed hundreds of thousands of cattle. The 250,000 cars. Dozens of lives have been lost in this nation. So now the question is, who's going to pay for this? Join us October 22nd and 23rd for 24 hours of reality as we identify the cost of carbon pollution and the solution that can change the course of our future. Last week, for 24 hours, a sleepless 72 hours, we ran around the globe six continents. There were two live bands and a number of other video components. And in the course of that, we had over 20 million views. And out of that, the hashtag cost of carbon went out to 250 million people and in the world of digital metrics reached in conversation 45 million people. That's an investment for a relatively small amount of money in today's world of getting the cost of carbon pollution into conversation. Having people start to understand that we're already paying in insurance and in healthcare costs as taxpayers and what happens when we have extreme weather events like we experienced in Colorado in the last month. The truth is we have this transition to putting a price on carbon is probably one of the simplest economic shifts that will ever take place in history. The amount of money we're already spending is so far in excess of what it will take to make this shift if we get over the political and policy hurdles that exist today. The only way to do that in the world today is to bring this conversation into culture through voices like women, mothers, through faith-based communities, through nurses because of the healthcare community, and to give them the tools that they use to reach their communities. The next project we're doing is actually involving the faith communities where they are coming to us and asking us to help 
create video projects, short little two and three minute clips that they can send throughout the evangelical communities and all faith leaders around the world. Finding a common language. I'm excited about it. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna turn out. <laughs> But I went to a meeting of all the state-based groups a number of months ago, and three or four of the organizations came up to me and said, would you help us? We don't know how to do this. I said, I know how to do this now. So the partnership was born. The other person that came up to the, that meeting, it was equally important and probably really the most significant voice before us. And I know you will agree, it was a young man who serves on an international task force advising the United Nations and the UNFCC about how to reach youth. And he waited a pretty long time uh, through the course of the day, and I kept seeing him standing off looking at me. I was kind of signaling that I, finally at the end of the day he walked over and he said, I didn't want to have a conversation with you when the others were around, and I said, okay. And he said, well, there's nobody creating anything that my generation wants to share. Ah, we are a sharing generation. We communicate. Our values are expressed by what we share with each other through digital means, through our mobile phones, rarely through our computers, but other devices, iPads. Could you help me create something that would reach youth around the world? And my answer was, as long as you're standing beside me, yes. So at the end of the day, my thought, my message to you, has been my message to myself. It's time to do things differently. It's time to have a conversation. It's time to remember that what we've always known, reaching other people is not like talking to ourselves. It's actually opening our eyes and our hearts and our ears and talking to them in their language. I hope you'll join me. Thank you so much. Thank you.